born in Athey Creek, would you guys stand with us? Hey, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Uh, it's going to be a communion service, this service, so if you don't have those communion elements, you can go to the back of the room and get them. There'll be some elders and deacons walking around handing those out, so put your hand up if you need them, and we'll get them to you. Lord, we ask your blessing on this service. Would you go before us? Would you show us what you have? And prepare our hearts. And surrender through the dwelling place of the Lord, most I enter in for our refuge is in the Lord, most I sing
how thankful we are that we can, in fact, trust you to do everything you say you're going to do, to trust your word. Lord, you have demonstrated faithfulness to the perfect degree. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do what we just sang, Lord, that we would trust in you with all of our heart, not leaning on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledging you for your word promises that you'll direct our paths. How we need that, Lord, for 2024 that you'd direct us through this coming year, that we would be moved with the passing of just your spirit over our lives and, and giving us understanding of what your heart, your mind is for our lives. 
Bless this time as we open our Bibles. Would you speak to us? Help us to apply your word practically. In Jesus' name, amen. Wednesday night, we'll continue our Through the Bible study. If you wanna read ahead, read Luke chapter 16 uh, as we continue through the Bible. Um, you might say, well, Brett, what happened to Luke chapter 15? Uh, that's what we're gonna do today. I have a plan uh, and it's gonna take a little work, but let's do it. Uh, I wanna go through chapter 15 and uh, I, I think this is a good New Year's Eve day sort of uh, thing to reflect on. So let's take a look, look at Luke 15. Luke chapter 15 deals with the topic of that which is lost. Have you ever felt lost? Um, there's so many different kinds of lost. You know, there's the just feeling lost directionally. Some of you are directionally challenged uh, and you refuse to ask for directions, so you end up lost. I see a few elbows flying as we speak. Um, but uh, others, you know, there's, there's different. I remember the most lost I ever felt was when I was a little kid. My family we were on a little uh, trip. I think it was somewhere in Southern Oregon, like, like maybe between Brookings and Medford, somewhere. And there was this, it was a foggy, foggy night. It was crazy level fog. And I remember my dad having to open the door of his driver's seat uh, door and, and he, he had to put a flashlight down to try to find the stripe on the pavement. Like literally you couldn't see like three feet in front of you. Um, you say, that's unsafe. Well, I, we, we knew that, my dad knew that, but he, he was just trying to figure out how to get off the road and get out of danger. It was so crazy thick. Um, my mom actually got out with a flashlight on the other side and was trying to find a, a, a place to pull off uh, that was you know, wide enough, but it was so thick, it was just almost impossible. Long story short, she found this little gravel road and we turned off and, and she just kind of, the, the gravel road sort of exited off the main road and then dropped down a little hill and we just kind of parked there. And my dad said, kids, this is an adventure. You know, me and my sisters, by the way, we, we had a Ford F-150 with a a canopy on the back. And then in the old days, we used to um, cut a hole between the window and the, the cab and the canopy. And then the kids all rode in the back. Uh, no safety belts for some of you that don't know. We used to go without safety belts. Um, uh, but uh, we would ride, my dad put this, this piece of plywood that was smooth and shiny. It was mahogany, I think. Um, uh, and he put it up. So we, the kids would lay with our heads sticking into the window of the cab. That's how we went on our trips and stuff. And, and around the corners, we'd slide back and forth. It was really fun. <laughs> So we were in this foggy night in that situation. And my dad said, kids, was an adventure. We're just gonna spend the night here and hopefully in the morning, you know, the fog will lift and we can make our way home. Um, so we just sat there and started to doze off a little bit, try to go to sleep in that cold night. But um, then something happened that was very troubling. You could feel and hear sort of a low rumble. It was a very deep, low rumble. And it was just kind of uh, one you could almost feel, you know what I mean? But it got louder and louder and it rumbled more and more. And then to make things even more kind of horrifying, there was this weird light that was starting to show up in the fog. Um, if you could picture um, the, the truck surrounded by fog, you can hear this rumbling. And then all of a sudden you see this light that's kind of bouncing around the fog, like and, and, and the rumble's getting louder. Pretty soon our windows of our truck are starting to rattle. Uh, and it's like, and, and my mom's like, what's, honey, what's happening? You know, my dad's like, uh, I don't know. And then we figured it out when it happened. And we realized, oh no, did we park on a train track? Like there's no way to really know. I mean, it's so foggy and we, we just really weren't sure. But my dad quickly, and you know, this happened so fast. He quickly jumps into the driver's seat, like get, grabs the keys. And just as he's putting the keys in, sure enough, the train reached our truck. Um, but good news, we were not on the tracks. What we were, however, was is directly under the tracks. There was an old, you know those old wooden train trestles? We were parked right under a train trestle and the, the train was just like 10 feet over our heads going by at like 70 miles an hour. So our, our truck was and, and you know, the kids were all, ah! you know, my mom, ah! my dad's, he was, he was always the cool, uh, calm one, you know. But uh, we just, we were sure we were dead. This is, I remember my mom saying, honey, I think God caused the train to pass right through our vehicle. Like, cause that's what it felt like. I mean, she wasn't wrong. It felt like that. But later we realized, no, we were just under the railroad tracks. And uh, I just, I remember that sense, even as a kid and, and even once in a while, our family talks about that, that night where we were helpless. We, we, we were sure we were gonna die in that moment. Um, but man, lost in the fog. And really sometimes I think that's the way life can be, where you're, you think you know where you're going, you've got plans and you know what you're doing, and then all of a sudden 
you're just kind of in a helpless situation, lost. Well, as it turns out, the, the idea of being lost is something God does not want for his people. He doesn't want you lost. He wants you found. The old amazing grace hymn, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. This is the content that is in the chapter in front of us here in Luke chapter 15. Let's begin there with verse one. Luke 15, verse one. It says, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eats with them. Now pause right there. This, these two verses set the stage for the rest of the chapter. And Jesus is gonna address this issue. What issue? What these publicans and sinners are accusing Jesus of. You might be saying, well, where's the Democrats, Pastor Brett? No, not Republicans. The word publican is uh, another word for tax collector in Bible times. And they were known thieves and dishonest people and disloyal to their own Jewish people and more uh, favoring the Roman empire. They were hated, but they were wealthy. So all the sinners would hang out with the publicans because they had the money. They would have big parties at their houses and the harlots and the uh, thieves and the you know, marauders and all those guys, they would all hang out together. So suddenly Jesus is not only hanging out with these people, but he's having dinner with them. And in Bible times, more than even today, I, I mean, today, if you have dinner with someone, it's like breaking bread together and there's sort of a unifying thing that happens. We all kind of get that. In Bible culture in these days, it was way even more intense than that. If you were having dinner with somebody, you were becoming one with them. You were uniting and agreeing with them is kind of the idea. So that's why they're, they're making two points, really. He receives sinners and he's having dinner with them. Can you believe that? That's what, that's what they're saying. Jesus is about to respond. And if you'll notice, uh, there's a lot of red letters coming. Uh, Jesus has a lot to say about what these guys are saying. Um, by the way, what's kind of interesting about this, um, have you ever noticed sometimes your enemies, when they're yelling at you or accusing you, sometimes they're actually right and correct? Um, you know, like, like here they're saying, Jesus, he's receiving sinners. What do you think Jesus said about that? He's like, sure do. That's what I do. In fact, Jesus even said, I have come to seek and save what? The lost. That's who Jesus came to seek and save, the lost, the lost sinners. And so these guys don't get it. They don't get Jesus' whole life on this earth was to come and seek and save the lost. And they're accusing him of that. That happened to me uh, a few years ago. I was talking to a guy. He was a guy who, um, one of these guys that holds the Bible as important, but church tradition uh, equally as important as the Bible, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, he, he believed that, that church history uh, should speak just as loudly as the Bible. Um, now, the reason I don't believe that, nor, you know, Athey Creek leadership here is because church history is full of all kinds of crazy, stupid stuff. There's some good stuff. We can learn from church history. I, I love studying church history, but in no way do I hold the Bible and church history on equal plane. So this guy was making, you know, AC Creek needs, you need to wear a robe, Pastor Brett, and you need to have a, a cross on your building and stained glass, and you gotta, you do this, and you gotta do that. And, and uh, you know, we went into this big conversation and I would always say, well, you know, the Bible says, and the Bible says, and it is written in the Bible. And, and finally, he just kind of got frustrated at our lunch there and he said, Brett, you know what? You're just one of those Bible guys. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. That's all I've ever hoped to be. Um, it was meant to be an insult, but I was one, one that I actually, have. This, this happened by the way to Jesus all the time. He's the guy who receives sinners. Sure is, that's what Jesus does. And this goes on and on. Even Caiaphas, uh, he made kind of an interesting charge um, in John 11, verse 50. He, he made a statement where he said that um, one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perishes not. And he was talking about Jesus. And you think, well, Brett, that's true. Jesus died for the nation of Jews and, and, and stuff like that. And then he even goes on and says, but not just this nation only, um, but also that he should gather together in one, the children of God. You say, Brett, that's inspired prophecy from, from Caiaphas. But if you know the context of what Caiaphas was saying, he's saying, if this guy Jesus gets any bigger, Rome's gonna come and take note and punish us. So let's <clears throat> save everyone by killing him. That's what he was saying. But isn't it funny what he was saying was actually true, that Jesus came to die to save the world from its sins? Um, he said that, but not knowing he was speaking the truth. Here's another one, Jesus hanging on the cross. He saved others. 
Himself he cannot save. Uh, another, that's just true. He, now, by the way, if you're crucifying a guy and you're admitting he saved others, is there something wrong with that? He saved others. Oh, maybe we shouldn't have crucified him because he did save others. They admitted that. But what about the second part? That's not true, Brett. It says uh, he, himself he could not save. Well, I would say that is true too. Jesus could not save himself because he would not save himself. He went with an objective to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Thus, he would not come down off the cross, so he could not. Uh, what an amazing irony, these people saying stuff that's actually true, even though they're the enemies of Jesus. So because of this, this little statement, he's the one who receives sinners and eats bread with them, Jesus is gonna talk about why he's doing this, and he's gonna talk about those who are lost. Some people say chapter 15 is, has three parables. Um, I'm gonna say uh, it's one parable. In fact, look at verse three. It says in verse three, he spake this parable unto them saying, and notice it's not parables, it's parable singular. And then red letters pretty much can continue all the way to verse 32. Um, so I believe it's, it's like one parable with three stanzas because they're all very much linked. The three parables are linked. Now what's interesting, and this is why I'm doing the whole chapter today, because um, I like gaining ground on our Through the Bible study, but I also want you to see the context of one of the more famous parables. One of these three parables, you all probably know pretty well, but do you know what the other parables are that are linked to it, that are importantly linked to it? Has anybody ever heard of the parable of the prodigal son? Yeah, most of you probably, even if you're not a Christian, like, I've heard about the prodigal son, I've got that story. But what were the other two parables? They're very much linked and it helps us see a, a picture and I hope we can learn from this as we go through this chapter. I love context uh, in the Bible. So Jesus is gonna give us these three stanzas or you might say three parables, but it's kind of like one big parable with three stanzas. And the first one, we're gonna call it um, the lost sheep sought out by the son. Now, one other thing about each of the three parables, there's a couple of fun stuff here for you Bible thinkers and students. Um, one thing we see in these three parables is a picture of the Trinity. We have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is pretty cool. I'll show you that as we get there. Also, um, we, we see uh, not only uh, the, the Holy Trinity, but we also see something that I find kind of fun um, as um, the, the argument continues to rage. And in fact, I feel like it's raging even more lately. I've noticed on social media, YouTube, the Calvinism versus uh, Arminian type thinking. Um, and, uh, and these guys get on and they get all angry and, and mean spirited. And I think that's such a misguided argument. Um, you know, Jesus didn't say, you'll know you're my disciples by your strong hyper Calvinism or your, your Arminian views. Uh, that's not how you're, how do they know we're our disciples? By our love one for another. And yet, it's the love that's lacking in so much of this discussion. But um, if you're wondering, Athey Creek takes what some people criticize as two-faced or uh, not landing on any one of the, the two. But we sort of, we, we kind of look at it like, um, you know, both systems, Arminian thinking and Calvinism, they're just two dudes that came up with theological theory about the way things work in the Bible. Um, some people say, no, it's fact. And, uh, and, and as it turns out, um, you know, they both ultimately fail in that they attempt to explain what I believe is the unexplainable. There are certain things in the Bible that are just really, I think, unexplainable because it's, it's um, laced with God and his awesome power and his ability. So for example, um, yes, God is absolutely sovereign. Uh, and knows all, he, he predestinated and divinely elected. I mean, I 100% I agree with my Calvinist friends on that. But yes, also human beings are called to make genuine decisions to place their faith in Christ Jesus to be saved. Um, so, you know, is it human responsibility to choose Christ or is it God chose you before the foundation of the world in his sovereignty? And the answer to me is yes. Uh, and if you try to explain well, but did I accept Jesus or did he choose me? And the answer is yes. Uh, that's the way I believe. It's very simple. Um, and by the way, the, there's people that are going on YouTube saying all the pastors that out there that teach that uh, should you know, be banned from the pulpit. Well, it just so happens that there's a, quite a few pastors, uh, much more important than little old me, 
that have believed that. Billy Graham, uh, Chuck Smith, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. In fact, Spurgeon wrote a book on hyper-Calvinism, uh, even though he's kind of a Calvinist Calvinist. Uh, but he warned about hyper-Calvinism. Like, it's, it's just a funny, funny thing that everybody gets all up, up in a tizzy. You're like, what does that have to do with chapter 15? Well, here's the thing. We're gonna see in these three parables concerning the lost, we're gonna see an example of human free will, a person choosing to come to the Lord. We're gonna see God's sovereignty, how he hunts down the lost soul and finds them himself and saves them. And again, it just illustrates what the Bible teaches from cover to cover, cover to cover, both are true. I, I want you to see that. Watch out for the people that are making such a massive deal, like it's an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. I believe there are essentials that we do fight over that are worth fighting for, but this one has gotten a little ugly and weird. Watch out for that. I think it's important. So we'll see that here. So the, the first parable is the lost sheep sought out by the son. We picked that up in verse four. It says, Jesus says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the 90 and nine and in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth on it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. By the way, this is interesting. Speaking of the, you know, uh, well, if God is sovereign and already knew this, why are the angels celebrating when one lost soul comes to Christ? Well, we already knew his name was written in the book of life. It's already, it was in big, you know, why would we celebrate something we've known for millennia? Uh, this is kind of funny in heaven. After a service, sometimes I'll mention that. I'll say, hey, you guys, people just got saved. People gave their hearts to Christ. And there's a party going on in heaven. Each one of these three parables are gonna show a party after the lost sinner is saved. Um, that's something to note. Um, here, the lost lamb is found. He goes and tells his neighbors and say, he says, rejoice with me. The, the sheep was lost, but now he's found. Now, for most of us, this is the easiest one of these parables because we know who the shepherd is. Who's the good shepherd in the Bible? Jesus. He's called the good shepherd. He's also called the chief shepherd. He's also called the great shepherd, all in the scriptures. So uh, this idea of Jesus being our shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, <clears throat> I shall not want. It's something that's very familiar to us if you're even kind of new to the Bible. But um, this, this illustration speaks of how the, the shepherd, Jesus, will go and find the lost sheep. Um, who's the lost sheep? As it turns out, that's uh, all of us. But speak for yourself. I'm no dumb lost sheep. Um, well, the Bible says, Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53, 6, he said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone his own way. Um, when we rebel and do anything contrary to God, we're like the lost sheep that's gone astray. But there's good news. We have a loving shepherd who will seek you out uh, and, and look for you to come back and repent of your sins and be saved and, and follow after the, the, the Lord, the good shepherd. Now with this, it says that the shepherd puts the sheep on his shoulders and rejoices. Now let's stir up another controversy. This is almost more controversial than Calvinism and Arminian thinking. What's that? This right here. Anybody see a Hallmark card with something like this on it this Christmas? Here's the shepherd putting the sheep on his shoulders. But here's the thing. Um, have you see, heard the controversy about the broken leg theory? Um, um, now, this is funny. If you go on Google and Snopes and do all that stuff, uh, which I always kind of laugh because people are more willing to you know, believe Google and uh, Snopes and stuff than they are to believe pastors, which I get that and understand why that probably is. But um, the, the, you know, maybe you've heard it taught where the shepherd will take the sheep that keeps going astray and break its little leg. Uh, is that true or false? Well, some of you will say, false, Brett, I looked it up and Snopes said it's false. So there you go, don't say it, Brett, you better not say it. Well, uh, I'm going to say it and I'm gonna say it with joy in my heart. Um, why? Well, as it turns out, there's evidence that that is, even though, you know, if you Google it, it'll be hard to find that evidence. But um, there's a great book, Philip Keller, uh, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. If you've never read that book, it's, and you know me, I recommend books like once every 10 or 12 years other than the Bible. Um, and that's one worth reading. It's easy reads. A shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, Philip Keller. He was a shepherd in the northern, uh, north 
uh, Eastern Africa, and even up into the Middle East. He spent most of his life as a shepherd. And then he writes about the Lord's, the Psalm of the Shepherd, Psalm 23. It's really a great book. But one of the things he talks about is this practice of the breaking of the lamb's leg. Why would a shepherd do that? And if you see the blogs and the people talking, oh, I would never follow a Jesus that breaks a poor little lamb's legs. And we, we always frame stuff that we're the poor little victim and I can't believe Jesus would break any lamb's leg. That's just not the Jesus I believe in. Really, you gotta be careful. Be careful with that. Because as it turns out, a shepherd uh, actually does correct the sheep. If, you, if, if the idiom of the shepherd and the sheep is something the Bible's interested in, and it is from cover to cover, you kind of have to take the whole deal. When the shepherd's Psalm, uh, Psalm 23 says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What, what does that mean? Well, the rod and the staff, they were two implements. And if you understand what a shepherd does, a shepherd will correct the sheep with the staff. It's like the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chasteneth. Does the Lord allow you to be broken? Uh, not, no, I'm talking figuratively. Uh, you know, will he allow your leg to be broken? Well, he will, if, if he wants to do that. But what about just a broken and contrite spirit? The Bible says the Lord is near to those that are of a broken and contrite spirit. So there is evidence from this Middle Eastern shepherd who writes about in ancient times, they used to do this. Now, what would happen? The, the lamb would just go off all the time and, and always cause trouble. Now in Bible times, a lamb was very valuable. It was worth money, but the shepherd also cared for his sheep. And he didn't want that lamb to become lamb chops for some wolf that was out there. Which one's worse, being lamb chops for a wolf or having a broken leg that's healed? Well, the shepherd would snap the leg of the little lamb, then he would carefully splint it, reset it, and then he would carry that lamb on, the, on his shoulders. So when you see the Hallmark card with the shepherd carrying the sheep, you're like, oh, it's so cute. He broke the lamb's leg. <laughs> um, you're like, I just don't wanna believe in a Jesus that would do that. Well, wait a minute, hold your horses there just for a second. Um, does anybody remember, what was David the psalmist? What was David the king? What was his occupation before he was a king? He was a shepherd. Did he know anything about shepherding? Yes. But when he was a king, man, he found himself sinning like nobody's business. Remember, he got into one situation where he murdered a guy because he committed adultery with another man's wife and he tried to cover it up with murder. Like that's a pretty tough situation. Talk about a, you know, a lost sheep. But if you read the narrative of David uh, when he was trying to hide his sin, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, they all talk about this time where David was trying to cover up his sin. And he said, oh, the hand of God was heavy upon me. My bones waxed old and my moisture turned into the drought of summertime. And he just talked about how horrible he felt. In fact, it's Psalm 51, pardon me, um, yeah, Psalm 51, verse eight. Uh, listen to this, David said, make me, he's talking to the Lord as a prayer, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. What, what's that all about? David, the context of this is David went astray with adultery and murder. Then he said in Psalm 32, blessed is he or happy is he whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And he realized that until he could, was willing to confess and repent, he was, he was broken and his bones waxed old and he had the heavy hand of God. And so when he confessed, he said, oh, blessed is he. That's what that song is that we sing. It comes from Psalm 32. But you might say, Brett, why would you have joy around bones which are broken? He says that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. What's he talking about? It's the same thing we're talking about here. The Lord would rather break David's bones than allow him to burn in hell for all eternity. The good shepherd would rather save the sheep, even if it is a time of broken leg. And, and why would the shepherd do that? He'd put them on the shoulders, carry them around for weeks after weeks, but that little lamb would start to be familiar with the shepherd's voice, would start to be familiar even with the shepherd's scent. Remember in John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. By the way, did you know, I think Philip Keller talks about this in his book. Um, they put the sheep in the sheep fold all, at nighttime, all the shepherds with all their sheep all at once. In the morning, a shepherd would get up, he'd walk up to the sheep fold and start singing a song. And the sheep of that shepherd knew the voice of the shepherd. And he would just start singing the song and walk away and all of his sheep would follow him. 
Then the next shepherd would come up and start singing his song. And then those sheep would follow that shepherd. So this idea of Jesus saying, my sheep, not all of these are my sheep. We talked about that last, last week. But he said, my sheep will hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So David, knowing all this stuff, he makes all kinds of comments about this, this idea. See, the little lamb that was there hearing the voice, taking on the scent, when the shepherd would put him back on the ground with a healed leg, that little lamb would stay tight by his side from that day forward, um, knowing the good shepherd. I would rather go through a time of brokenness and be close to Jesus than to do my little rebellious, all we like sheep have gone astray thing, only to be forever away from God. I would take the broken leg any day over. In fact, that's why David says, the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. And some of you can say that maybe you've had broken bones in your life. You've been through broken times and you, and you look back and think at the time you hated it. I can't believe I'm going through this God. And then you realize it was the Lord growing you up, making you start to hear the voice of the shepherd. And, and, and you look at some of those wounds of your scars of your past, you think, thanks Lord, I would rather have the scars and the wounds of the past and be solid with you than to have a life with no trouble at all, but away from Jesus. I, would trade, I wouldn't trade the broken bones for any day, anything. It's a loving shepherd who does that. So this is the analogy. The first lost thing that he's talking about is this idea of the lost sheep and how the shepherd goes and finds the lost lamb. I love that. Um, so all that to say, um, would you rather have times of brokenness and, uh, and then be in heaven and rejoice or uh, have no brokenness and have to end up in judgment and wrath? So the lost sheep sought out by the son. Number two on this parable, uh, you know, stands on number two, uh, the lost coin. Uh, and we're gonna see, the first one was linked to the son, the second part of the Holy Trinity. The second one is linked to the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Holy Trinity, the lost coin. Let's take a look, verse eight. Um, Jesus goes on. Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. See, Jesus is setting the stage for these Pharisees who are saying, I can't believe he receives sinners. And, and, and Jesus is saying, oh yeah? I'm all about seeking out the lost sinner. And when that sinner is found, all of heaven is rejoicing with the angels. Don't you love this? Jesus is kind of letting them have it. You guys don't care about lost sinners. That's my whole thing. I'm into saving the lost. Now this lost coin is interesting because I already told you all we like sheep. You know, that's kind of an insult. You might be, Brett, I'm not a dumb sheep. And it's funny, I'm not saying this. God compares you and me to being dumb sheep. Sheep are the dumbest animal. I, I'm telling you, I know about these things. I had sheep growing up. I was uh, a little kid in 4-H and we had sheep. Um, I, I say stuff like this. And I had a family a couple of weeks ago come up and say, Pastor Brett, we raise sheep on a farm. And you're totally right. Everything you say about sheep is true. <laughs> I felt, you know, avenged uh, uh, because sheep really are dumb. They're cute. They're cuddly, dumb as a brick. They're nearsighted. They get easily spooked. And the Lord says, guess what? You're like sheep. Now, if you're feeling kind of bad about that right now, I'm not dumb. Yes, you are. Um, uh, there's something else. The coin, however, is something of value. Yes, we're like sheep, the Bible says, but we also have value. God values us. We're the coin in the story here. And if we're a lost coin, the Lord says, I, will, I, wanna, I wanna find you. Now, now what's, what's interesting about the lost coin, there's some philosophical things to ask. The sheep is stupidity, the coin is that of value. Um, what makes a coin of value? Well, you can use it to buy something, you can purchase something, um, you can redeem something for a price. But here's a question philosophically, is a lost coin valuable? Does it still have value? That's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Like if I took a gold, we gotta go to a gold coin because you're thinking, what, 25 cent coin, whatever, who cares about that? Well, in Bible times, there are coins, this is a silver coin. And in those days, it was worth a lot. So let's just say you have a big fat gold coin that's worth $5,000. And we run over to Wilsonville and as we're driving on the freeway, ping, we flick it out over into the Willamette River and it sinks to the bottom of the river. Is that coin still valuable? 
Now you can sit around and philosophize. Is that coin Rallabule is sitting at the bottom of this pristine Willamette River? Um, well, um, I would say it doesn't have value in the sense that nobody can use it. It's unusable. It, therefore, it really has no value as long as it's lost. In a lost condition, the coin has no value. But when can that coin have value again? Once it's found. When a coin is found again, then it has value. That's kind of what the Lord's saying here. This coin, this lost coin has value as long as it's found. And because of that, that valuable coin that was found, the woman rejoices along with her neighbors. And then Jesus says, and even in heaven, there's a party going on. He says that um, on both of these uh, stories. Now, I say the lost coin, searching of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the link here to the Holy Spirit, you might ask? Because uh, we saw it. it's easy to see the sun in the shepherd. But how's the Holy Spirit here? Well, theologians write about these things. There's some interesting implications about a woman who's searching for a coin. What's the first thing she does? She lights a candle. And the flame and the lighting of this candle uh, is actually kind of a, a, a type in the Bible of the Holy Spirit in and of itself. Uh, and we can get into some other things about the sweeping out of the house and what the Holy Spirit does if you kind of study the working of the Holy Spirit. There's even something that's a little more controversial and I, I risk going into something I don't have time to talk about. But let me just make it clear. I believe God is always talked about in the masculine. There's people that are gender confused, not only personally, but biblically. They wanna make God into some woman or something like that. That's not God. Every time we talk about God in the Bible, it's in the masculine. However, and this is where I have to tread lightly, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, if there were ever any wonderful uh, motherly, I'm gonna say, qualities of God, which there are, it's often expressed through the working of the Holy Spirit. If you read about like the Holy Spirit's working in John 12 and uh, John 14 and John 16, you'll actually hear about how the Holy Spirit's the comforter um, and he wants to remind us of truth, like your mom reminded you to put on your jacket on the way to school. Like the Holy Spirit reminds us of things we need to know. That's a motherly thing, um, compassion and nurturing and caring. Um, it is interesting that this is a woman looking for the lost coin. And because of that, um, by the way, whenever you see the term Holy Spirit, often it's either in the neutral or feminine, which is kind of an interesting thing linguistically. For those of you that want to study that, you can dive into that. But let's be clear, God is not a woman. However, I do love, you know, man is created in the image of God. And I would say that everything we see in men that's wonderful, you can say, well, that, that must be the image of God. But in the same way, everything we see in women that's wonderful, that's part of God's nature too. We're all part of that image of who God is. So what's the part of image of, of the woman? I don't, I don't know for sure, but I, I have a hunch. Aren't you glad that God is compassionate and loving? Um, you know, when I used to be a little kid and I'd skin my knee, if you go to your dad, what did you get? Your dad would say, toughen up, man. It's just, what is it, a little scrape? And you take a toothpick and poke you in the knee with it and say, does that hurt? Um, the, that's dad. Mom would say, oh, I'm so sorry. Here's a Batman Band-Aid and, you know, just get you all set up. That was mom because mom had this deep, tender heart. That's, that, both the Lord has both of those qualities in the best sense of the way. Can you imagine Jesus? He walks up in Jerusalem. He says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you've stoned the prophets. And as he said, but I would have come and gathered you as a mother hen gathers his chicks under her wing. Here's an experiment. If you're in construction, if you're a construction worker, here's what you do this week when you go back to work, get all the guys around the job site, say, guys, I love you so much. I would have just gathered you as a mother hen gathered her chicks under her wing. See how that goes for you on the construction job. <laughs> You'll probably get beat up. That's not gonna work out for you because, well, but Jesus could pull that off, by the way. Um, how could he pull that off? Because I think it was ultimate sincerity. But I also think Jesus was very masculine. There's no question of that if you read the narrative of the gospel. But he also had that same loving tenderness and compassion so much that he could pull off, I would have gathered you as a mother hen statement. That's an amazing thing about our Lord. Um, I believe that is linked to the working of the Holy Spirit, by the way, that tender compassion, that's part of the Holy Spirit. He's comforter. The Bible tells us all that about. So the lighting of the candle, the fact that it's a woman and that she is sweeping out the house, all of those things, uh, theologians do link that to the working 
of the Holy Spirit. So you've got the lost sheep sought out by the Son. You have the lost coin searching of the Spirit. And then the third component of this stanza of, the, of this parable is the lost son uh, accepted of the Father. Let's take a look, verse 11. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, you guys probably know this, but here's a son asking for his inheritance before his dad kicks the bucket. That's not normal. This is a son saying, give me, give me, give me. I want, I want my stuff now. I don't wanna wait for you to kick the bucket, dad. Um, we're supposed to kind of be offended by this goofy son whose ill-intentioned desires are to get all the stuff. But I hope your relationship with God is not give me, give me, give me. Because God wants to have a relationship with you, just like this father wants to have a relationship with his son in the parable. But if your prayers are, Lord, give me this, and give me that, and give me, give me, give me, I think you might be a little bit prodigal son material. Don't, don't be that, be careful on that one. Not the, by the way, there was a whole movement of this uh, in the name it and claim it movement. The word of faith, movement. just speak it out and God will give it to you. And you know, uh, you know, if you give your love gift and seed faith and all this stuff that people talked about, and it was only just to get the church you know, richer or these single pastors richer and richer. And it was the, the, the word of faith movement, you know, it was ugly. Um, but that's not the relationship we're supposed to have with God. Give me, give me, give me. Uh, it's quite different than that. And so this is the prodigal. So what happens in verse 13, it says, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. <laughs> now, we miss this as people are like, oh good, he's got a job as a farmer. No, that's not what's going on. The lowest place a Jew could ever think of being is feeding unkosher pigs. He's the official pig slopper. That is not a job a Jewish boy would ever want. This is the lowest point a guy could be, but it's even worse than that. He's so hungry, check it out. Um, uh, it says there, um, verse 16, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave to him. And verse 17, when he came to himself, now pause for a second, what does that word, that phrase, when he came to himself mean to you? Um, what was he before? You see, the, the coming to yourself or coming to your senses means that he, was, he lost his marbles somewhere along the way. He, he was kind of doing insane things. And now he's coming to himself, or that's the idea here. He's, he's gathered himself is the idea here. And can I just suggest rebelling against God and doing sinful stuff is insane. We think we're gonna pull it off. We think we're gonna enjoy our sin and we're gonna take it up like this prodigal son. He spends the money and it's all great for a while. The Bible even says there is pleasure in sin for a short season. But the end of sin is misery and sadness and despair. And this guy now is there. So it is kind of insanity. In fact, the Bible's full of these kind of stories. Remember Nebuchadnezzar who was walking in pride and he walked around Babylon, Daniel, book of Daniel talks about this. And he says, look at the kingdom of Babylon that I have set up. And Daniel's like, Nebi, man, chill. Don't be so prideful. Break off your sins. Trust in the Lord. Who is the Lord? Who is God that can move my glorious hand? Do you remember what happened right after that? He goes insane. In fact, he goes so insane, he, he runs out into a field and gets on all fours and starts mooing and chewing cud like a cow. Can you imagine you're driving by and also you see this dude out there and he's like, Murr. like that's our, that's our king right there. Uh, that guy used to be sitting on the throne, now he's out. And, and the Bible seems to imply that he, he chewed the cud with the cows for seven years. Um, and it got even weirder than that. And it grew this feathers and it's like weird stuff. But after seven years, his senses came back to him and the Lord opened his eyes and he suddenly was not insane. Can you imagine waking up out there in the field with the cows going, what am I doing here? And what did Nebuchadnezzar say? He said, those who walk in pride, God is able to abase, I guess. And those are the last words Nebuchadnezzar ever said in recorded history. All that to say, don't be 
the, the person who wants to play with sin and do all the stuff that the Bible says don't do. And you're like, I can do it. I'm getting away with it. I'm the exception to the rule. Um, sure as, as you know it, man, sin will, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Number 32, 23 declares. Well, this lost son is at that point where he comes to his senses. So verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now, this is funny. He's rehearsing in his mind. Okay, I'm gonna go back to dad. And I'm gonna say, hey, dad, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me. Now, this is an interesting change of tune. Remember the last time he was, give me, give me, give me. Now in verse 19, make me as one of your hired servants. So um, this is where uh, this guy comes up with sort of a way to get back to his dad. And he's not even expecting to be called the son anymore. He just would rather, he, he's willing because he's in such misery, he's willing to just be a servant in the house of his dad. But sometimes some of you, one of the reasons you don't come back to the Lord as a prodigal is because of all the stuff you're gonna have to do to get back in good standing with God. This guy wrongly comes up with this narrative. Okay, maybe if I say it this way and I would say, you know, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but you know, he, he rehearses this thing. Let's see how far this little rehearsed thing gets him. What is it that makes the father receive the prodigal son? Check it out, let's read on. It says, verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. How many of his little rehearsed words did he get out so far? None. This is so beautiful. This is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, if you ask me. Here's this prodigal who's quite the stinker, literally stinking from the pigs. Um, he took the dad's money, squandered it on all kinds of horrible things. And what is the father doing? He's sitting there with his binoculars, looking out the window, hoping and wondering if his son's ever gonna come back. And when he's still a great ways off, the father sees him. And what does he do? He bolts, man. He runs. Um, you know, the father in the story is a beautiful picture of God the father. Remember, we had the, the son and the sheep, the Holy Spirit in the coin. But this is the picture of the father, the lost son, accepted of the father. The father looks, and when he comes, he runs. And this picture of God the father is so amazing to me. Why? Because in the Bible, God is never pictured or illustrated as being in a hurry or being uptight. You never see God pacing in heaven or wringing his hands. We always see God just seated on the throne, always in full control. God never is worried or freaked out, fearful about anything. But the only time you see in the Bible God pictured as being in a huge hurry is to run out to the prodigal son who's returning. In other words, the only time you see God in a hurry is to be forgiving and merciful and compassionate. And the son with his little routine, uh, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't get those words out and the father's already kissing him on the neck. But after he kisses him on the neck, the son's like, oh, okay, I better do my little rehearsed thing. So what does he say? The son, verse 21, said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now does the father say, well, son, since you said that, let's talk about that. No, the father almost seems to ignore his little rehearsed apology. Almost, check it out, you tell me. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Does this remind you of anything that the Bible teaches, this best robe thing? Isaiah 61.10, it says what? We are robed in his righteousness. This is a picture of that right here. The stinky pig slop son comes walking up, father, I'm no longer worthy. And he doesn't even really acknowledge what he says. It's just the fact is he is repentant. How do I know he's repentant? Because he did a 180. He, he, he walked away from God, the father, if you would. And then in the pig slop, he said, okay, I'm done with this. And he did a repentance. He turned around and came back to the father. And then the father, because of his repentance, it's almost like he's like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. But he talks to the other, kill the fatted calf, bring the best robe and put it upon my son, even as he robes us. In our filth, he robes us with his righteousness. This is such a beautiful picture of the lost. 
Remember, the Pharisees started this God, I can't believe he eats with sinners. And Jesus is saying, oh yeah? Not only will I take the sinner, but I'll robe him in the best robe and I'll take him in and kiss him on the neck and feed him with, notice the fatted calf. Um, it says in verse 23, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. What is required for the remission of sin, anybody? The shedding of blood. The Bible says there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Um, in this little picture, there is a sacrifice kind of made. I, I don't want you to think God just winks at our sin and says, welcome home, child, you're back. But there, there was, even in this story, the picture of sacrifice when the killing of the fatted calf. The point is when you sin, God doesn't just wink at your sin. He embraces you, robes you, but it's because the lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. All the pictures are here that are so perfect. Um, he says, let us eat and be merry, verse 23. For verse 24, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. All three of these parables, one parable with three stanzas, um, end with the finding of that which is lost and then a big party ensues. That's why we talk about after a service, we have a party in heaven. Now, one of the things that we have to tie up a loose end here, this beautiful story about Jesus is saying, man, I'm into finding the lost. Um, we have a problem that we haven't tied up and that is the problem of the older brother. Um, let's take a look. It really is the last part of this story in verses 25 uh, through 32. It says, now his elder son was in the field as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He's like, hey, what's going on? Verse 26, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. <clears throat> and he said unto him, thy brother has come. And thy father has killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgress I at any time uh, thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But, thou, but as soon as uh, this thy son was come, which hath devoured your living with harlots and has killed for him the fatted calf. And he, the father said unto him, son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. It was meat or it was good that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He's saying, son, you're, you're with me. You're already, you've already repented. There's no need of repentance, um, you know, but all that I have is yours. But, but you should be rejoicing with all of us because your brother was lost but now he is found. The reason the context of this is so important is because of the first part, who is Jesus? See, we always like to put ourselves in the story. Maybe you're the prodigal. That could be true and you need to come back to the Lord, the father who will run out and kiss you on the neck and wrap you with a robe of righteousness. Maybe that's you. Some of us would say, well, that's us. We're the, maybe I'm guilty of being the older brother. I could care less if people are lost and found. All I care about is myself and where I'm at and what I get out of the deal. You know, I, I'm sad to say it, but that's a propensity in modern Christianity is to just kind of think about yourself and not really worried about the lost. The church has lost the ability to search and be a part of God's tool to bring in those that are lost. And we take in this attitude, us four and no more. We could care less if people are getting saved. Um, God forbid Athey Creek Christian Fellowship becomes the older brother Christian Fellowship. There's a lot of churches that sort of take on that thing. It's us four no more, and we're just gonna do our little thing and, and we're not gonna care about the lost. I think that's why I get a little bit prickly. Maybe some of you are offended by me when I'm doing the invitation at the end of a service and inviting people to accept Jesus Christ, the lost, to be found by Jesus. And I'm always a little surprised that there's a bunch of people in our congregation uh, that think, oh, this is a good time for me to get up and leave and beat the traffic. Now, trust me. 
I get it. The traffic is insane. I know. Uh, you know, if you just kind of play your cards right, what you do is you leave church at a leisurely pace, get in your car and then pray and seek the Lord and talk to your family about the service and what you learned in Sunday school and just enjoy the time together for an hour while you're getting out of the parking lot. <laughs> We're doing everything we can to shorten that. I, I understand it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. I get that part of it but I still am a little amazed and I start making comments about when people get up, I, I, I try to keep my mouth shut, but I start talking about people's weak bladders and, and stuff. And I apologize for that, but, um, but you kind of deserve it. Um, <laughs> but when we're inviting people, the lost to be saved, is that the time to get up and say, oh, I need to get up now and uh, stretch the legs. This is the time where the true Christians, I would say, should be in deep and fervent prayer, praying for the souls of the lost that they might be softened toward the good news of the gospel and be a part of the service in that way because that's a big deal. Jesus is into this. Um, so should we be into it. I hope we're never that older brother church that doesn't care about those that are lost that are being saved. It's such an important part of who we are as Christians because it's part of who he is. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. What a glorious thing. You see how the, the older brother here is really a picture of these religious leaders. They were doing their little religious Jewish thing, but they could care less about the lost sinners. The older brother in context of what Jesus is talking about here, he's talking about the Jews, specifically the religious leaders who could care less about the lost. That's something we should watch out for as religious people. Um, you know, the Lord wants to have people that were lost found. You know, some of you in this room were lost and the Lord found you in a radical way and you're so glad about that and we have reason to rejoice. Others of you might still be in a place where you kind of feel lost. Maybe your life doesn't have value. Maybe this is a good time for you to come back to Christ. Uh, if you're never saved, if you're not part of the kingdom, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, this is, you're gonna be lost um, and your life will lack value. Um, what you need to do is accept Christ and believe. The Bible says, Romans 10, verse nine and 10, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him up from the dead, it says, you'll be saved. You'll be like the old hymn singer, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So do that, confess your faith to Christ. That's the way you're saved. Um, I'd like to end this service with us just celebrating because every one of these things ended up with a party. Um, the, Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. That is communion. So if you'd take out those little uh, communion elements that you were given or took on the way in, if you didn't get one, no problem. The, the crew is gonna come up and they'll just raise your hand, uh, let us know how many you need. And you just peel off this little bottom part and you get to the little piece of matzah bread in there. And then you take off the top layer and get to the cup. And there we get to celebrate what Jesus said. Do this often in remembrance of me. And let's really prepare our hearts because this is something that's to be taken with great reverence, uh, communion. Oh Lord, how thankful we are for the fact that you are the one who seeks out and saves the lost. Give us the same heart, Lord, that you have. Give us that same heart for the lost. We live in a lost city of Portland with a lot of people who need to be saved and just give us a heart for the lost, Lord. I pray that not only here in the church, but also those that would go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Give us a boldness and a faith. But thank you, Lord, for the, the covering, the robing of righteousness. Thank you for taking us in and being compassionate. Um, this communion service is such a great way to remember what you have done for us. And all who are thirsty and all who are Just come to the fountain, dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out too deep and we sing. Lord, this bread is such a beautiful reminder of what you did for us, sending your son, Jesus, his body being brutally beaten, 
nailed to the cross, back whipped and crown of thorns on your brow. Lord, as you took that hit for us, we were the ones who deserved to die for our sins, but you were the propitiation, the satisfaction, the substitution of, of our sins in our place. And we're thankful for that, Lord. We know that you don't just robe us in your righteousness, just glibly or naively. You had a perfect plan through your son, Jesus. So we remember that. We eat this bread with thanksgiving. As we take in this bread, would you fill us, Lord, with the bread of life? More of your son. May 2024 be marked as a Jesus year for us, Lord, where we stay at the shepherd's side and don't stray away. Help us, Lord. So we eat this bread now with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, let's all eat of the bread of Christ together. For the cup that's before us, Lord, we're thankful that your cup runneth over, that the blood of Jesus never runs out. For your mercies are new every morning and your mercies endure forever. For those that have been prodigals, for those who have been lost in any way, shape or form, I'm so thankful how easy it is to come back, even right now. As we just confess our sins to you, Lord, you'll just take us back and love us because of what you did for us. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So wash us clean, Lord. Give us a new start. We turn all the dials back to zero. We start with a clean slate in this coming 2024. And I pray that we'd have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness as we walk with you, Lord. So we drink deeply now of you with thanksgiving in our heart. Thank you, Lord. And let's drink of Christ together. What can I give to you? All that you've given to me. I'll give glory and honor from a heart made new. I'll give my life to you. Let's all stand together. What can I give to you for all that you've given to me? I'll give glory and honor from a heart made new. I'll give my life to you. I'll give my life. Lord, how thankful we are for such a glorious salvation. Bless these, your people. Lord, I pray for a joyful and glorious new year as the world shakes in their shoes, wondering what's gonna happen in 2024. We put our confidence in you, our trust in you, and we wanna follow you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So bless this congregation now as we go our way. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. amen. Hey, we'll see you next year. God bless.